All right, I've got the okay that things look good from the attendee side, so we're good to go. Great, well, I'll get us started then. Hello, my name is Austin Hartke. Uh, I'm leading this session, uh, and we are talking about seeing gender diversity in scripture. Um, so before we uh, fully get started with the PowerPoint and get into everything, um, I'll give you a little bit of a background about me. Um, uh, that is that, first of all, uh, I'm a trans guy. I am a graduate of Luther Seminary. My degree is in Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, so that's kind of where my background is. Um, I uh, wrote a book about all this stuff. <laughs> um, not the only book about all this stuff by any stretch of the imagination, but my book is called Transforming the Bible and the Lives of Transgender Christians. And uh, that came out in 2014, no, 2018, excuse me. Um, and uh, I'm also the director of Transmission Ministry Collective, which is an organization to support trans and gender expansive Christians. Um, so that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, let's see, we've got, um, uh, the uh, Q&A thing going on here in Zoom. So if you have questions throughout this session, feel free to put them in the question and answer bit. And I will try to take a look at them as we get toward the end, toward some questions. I know that I have a lot uh, that I wanted to, I want to get through today, um, but I also wanna leave time for questions. So if there are times when I skip through a slide or two, it's just because I wanna leave more time for questions. Um, and that's why it's so wonderful that we have so many other books and places to find this information. And we'll talk about where to find that stuff as well. So let's get into it. I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. All right. So seeing gender diversity in scripture, that's what we're talking about today. Um, I want to start out kind of acknowledging this big question that so many people have. Uh, and that question is, what does the Bible say about being transgender? <laughs> how, how do we, um, where are we getting some of our beliefs and understandings about what it means to be trans, especially in Christian community? Um, this is the big question everybody wants to ask. And the problem is, that we don't have a good answer in the Bible for the question, what does, like, what does the Bible say about being transgender? We don't have an answer to that in the Bible. We have, um, uh, as one of my professors in seminary used to say, uh, the Bible can definitely answer some of our questions, but we have to ask the right question. If we ask the question, what does the Bible say about being trans? Uh, we get this error message because the Bible doesn't talk about being trans specifically. That wasn't a way that they understood things. Um, so we've got to ask some different questions. So before we get into asking those questions, I want us to just have a basic, basic understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about gender. Uh, there are lots of different models for understanding gender. Um, lots of different uh, ways of sort of formulating this. This model that I'm using um, is adapted from um, Gender Spectrum, which is a great organization in San Francisco for, uh, for gender expansive youth. Uh, and Gender Spectrum, uh, this is kind of the way that they explain it. So gender is made up of three different facets and those facets all affect each other. So the first facet is your body. Um, we sometimes call this your assigned sex. So this has to do with your internal and external reproductive organs, your chromosomes, your hormone levels, your brain matter. That's all the body section, right? We all kind of have a sense of what that is. Then there's your gender identity, which is your internal self-perception of being male or female or both or neither. So your gender identity, we tend to think of that as being kind of in your brain, right? And then your gender expression, which is the way that you show your gender to others through your hair, your clothing, your voice, your mannerisms. Um, and all of those things have gendered values in your particular society. So if you go to another society, another culture, they're gonna have maybe different understandings around gender for these parts of expression. So it's different in different places. So these are sort of the three facets. And we talk about them uh, as separated in this way to kind of understand more about how they work to kind of get in with a magnifying glass. But as you can see, all these things affect each other, right? Your gender identity 
happens in your brain, which is part of your body <laughs> and which is affected by, for instance, your hormone levels, right? Um, uh, so when we sometimes talk about this whole model, we talk about how gender is biopsychosocial, <laughs> which is a long word, but biopsychosocial is one of the ways that we talk about gender. So that's what we're talking about today. So when we talk about gender in the ancient world, um, we have to understand that um, uh, certain things that we now today consider to be identities were not necessarily seen as identities back then. Certain parts of gender um, were like there was a very um, there was an understanding about what it meant to be male or female, right? But certain parts of gender were not identities; they were about things you did. Um, the same thing is true for orientation or sexual orientation. It wasn't necessarily a thing that you were, it was stuff that you did. People were much more concerned about actions. So when we're looking at scripture today, we have to keep this in mind that we can't go back into the Bible um, and, uh, you know, anachronistically say, oh, look, there's a trans person, because that's not how they, um, that's not the language they would have used for themselves, right? However, we do see people throughout scripture and throughout uh, our sort of written history of the ancient world um, who are gender expansive or gender, gender variant, gender non-conforming. Um, we can use that language as sort of a larger umbrella term for people that don't necessarily fit the gender boxes. So that's what we're looking at today. So today we're looking at three things. Instead of looking for trans people in the Bible, we're gonna look for where might there be gender diversity in places where we assume that there's only a binary, only one thing or the other, only male or female, right? Second question, what does the Bible say about visible aspects of gender roles and gender expression? So what the things, when it is concerned, when the Bible is concerned about things that we do and ways that we present, um, what is it saying about those things? And third, what biblical stories resonate with gender diverse people today and why? So those are the three questions we're gonna be looking at as we go through here. Um, I wanna just stop for a second to look at the questions. Let's see, um, where, where did I get my shirt? Oh my gosh, that's so nice. It's from Ben Wildflower uh, is the guy, name of the guy who designed it. It's uh, from the Magnificat. Um, Will you have access to the PowerPoint after the session? We will find a way to get you the PowerPoint. So don't worry about taking um, uh, uh, notes extensively in the moment. All right, here we go into the, into the weeds here. So let's start with Genesis uh, chapter one, the first uh, part of creation. Creation um, happens in two parts in Genesis. We have one version of the story in Genesis chapter one and another version in Genesis chapter two. So in Genesis chapter one, the center section here of this passage says, so God created humankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So sometimes when people read this passage, they see that binary, right? They see that, uh, that male and female, the either or, right? And that's what sticks. They go, well, God created people male or female, period, right? Um, in reality, when we think about the, the, the full context of what's going on in this chapter, we see a much wider picture painted. Uh, what happens at the very beginning of Genesis 1, right? God says, let there be light, and God creates light and separates it from the darkness, right? God says, let the water uh, under the earth and the water over the earth be separated, and then you have the sky and, you know, the water under the sky, right? Then God does the same, another thing where God says, let the water and the land be separated. So now you have water and land, right? In all these places, God is creating by organizing. God, God and Marie Kondo maybe would get along well and, and maybe do get along well. <laughs> uh, the, the organization of things is what is creating the world. And God's organizing things into twos the whole way through. Um, so when we see things like God saying there's day and night, God saying um, there's land and sea, right? Um, it's not surprising to us that when we get to God's creation of humans at the end of this text, God creates male and female. Same thing happening there. But 
that doesn't mean that things that exist in between or outside of those boundaries, those two boxes don't exist. So for instance, you've got day and night, but you also have dawn and dusk, right? So for instance, take a look at this photo. When we're looking at this photo, humans want to take a point and go, aha, there's where night starts and there's where day ends, right? And if you are maybe a meteorologist or uh, somebody who, um, you know, it, that your job is to create, you know, segments of things so that humans can understand it, kind of like we thought about those three segments of gender, right? Like we, we want to organize things so that we get it better. Um, so we might say, okay, you know, frame what? Frame eight is where night starts and day ends, right? But we recognize that there's all this stuff in the middle here that is so much more fluid than just one box or the other. The, the further you zoom in, the more boxes there are, it almost seems like. And that's what we see in all of creation, right? In the same way we see the designation between land and sea, well, there's also coral, coral reefs and marshes and estuaries, beaches, all these places that are not just land or sea. In the same way, we see the same thing happening even within humanity, even with human bodies. So this is just a, a graph of average height for men and women. Um, uh, and what you can see here is that there's something called a double bell curve, right? Most women seem to fall along the, what, 163 centimeter mark. And most men fit around the 178 centimeter mark. But there's that huge overlap right in the middle, right? So even when we think that there are two boxes, there's so often more to it than that that exists in between those boxes and outside on the edges of those boxes. So we're seeing diversity um, in the natural world, right? This is all about diversity in the natural world. When the first folks were putting pen to paper uh, or papyrus or whatever they were writing on to write down the words of Genesis 1, uh, they weren't saying that all of this diversity of creation doesn't exist. They, if they were trying to write an encyclopedia, they would have written an encyclopedia. But what they were trying to do was talk about the fact that God creates the world and creates the world good. So when we see just God created them male and female, that doesn't mean that nothing else exists. I love this quote. Um, this is from a book called Torah Queries, which is from our uh, Jewish siblings, our queer Jewish siblings that uh, who are working on translation in this passage. They talk about the Hebrew um, phrase zakar unekeva, right, male and female. Uh, they talk about how it's a merism, a biblical figure of speech in which the whole is alluded to by some of its parts. So another way that we do this within Christianity is when we talk about God. When we talk about God as the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, that doesn't just mean God is the first and the last, right? It means God is all in all, but we use two parts to kind of make that make sense. So what if these writers are saying, we see male and female in Genesis as doing the same thing? Uh, not, uh, it's, it's alluding to the whole by the sum of its parts. So let's talk about uh, two here. Um, the, in, in Genesis chapter two, we have another uh, creation story where God creates um, the, the first human and God says, it's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So God creates all these animals and brings them to this first person, but a helper is nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. And with the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The human said, this one finally is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called a woman because from a man she was taken. So in this text, um, we've got one person uh, and the person can't find another person like them. And so God takes, um, when it says one of, one of this person's ribs, um, the word there for rib is probably better translated as side. A side is taken from this person and made into a second person. Uh, and so when um, the, when sort of the ancient rabbis, again, kind of going to our, our Jewish siblings for a minute, because they've been studying the Hebrew Bible much longer than Christians have. <laughs> um, when they look at this first passage, it's interesting how they look at it. So this is a, a text from between uh, about 300 and 500 CE. It was a commentary on Genesis. Uh, 
And the way they made sense of this, they looked at Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, and they kind of tried to say, how do we put these together? And the way that they came up with it is they thought, okay, God must have made a human that is both male and female. And then when a side is taken away from that first human, it's kind of like they're cut down the middle, right? And then you get two people. And if this looks familiar to you, um, and you recognize it from Plato, for instance, from Plato's Symposium, or from um, uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, <laughs> if you recognize this, um, uh, this idea that originated in Jewish text study um, was what uh, eventually influenced Plato and Plato's understanding of humanity. So we've got this interesting understanding of what the first humans looked like, and this understanding that maybe there is more than just or sort of binary of male and female. So this is not to say, here's how we should understand this, this story today, but to just give you a sense of like, people in the ancient world had uh, maybe more imagination around gender and the creation of gender than we do today. So I wanna take a second here. Um, Cause I'm gonna try to look at a bunch of these questions later, but I just wanna make sure there's nothing that people are uh, oh yeah, I just see here, Jordan says, the land and sea dawn dusk analogies can make gender sound like a spectrum with two ends, male and female. What about identities that exist outside or beyond the binary? Yes, thank you for asking that, Jordan. Um, so yeah, I think the, what we see in the Bible is this sense of moving from a two box system to a spectrum system <laughs> in terms of how we understand gender. And I would argue that um, the more like we even have to, I, I think of it as like a, um, a dimensional thing, moving from two dots to a line <laughs> and then thinking about the fact that we are 3D people, we exist in a 3D reality, um, to think about gender, not just as two boxes or a, or a line between two boxes, but as a 3D space. Um, and that there are genders that don't um, identify inside either of those boxes or as in between. Um, there are many people, many non-binary people, many genderqueer people who don't see the spectrum as making sense for them because they don't feel like a mixture of male and female. They feel like their gender isn't even represented on that line, right? So I think it's important to note that even though I think what we see in scripture kind of points toward a more of a spectrum of understanding, I would argue that um, the as we learn more about gender in the hundreds and thousands of years since these texts were written, we might be moving toward more of a 3D sense of gender. Um, so I, I think that's definitely something that we're moving towards. So I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. So when we're thinking about clothing um, and gender expression, we uh, often hear about Deuteronomy 22, five, which says, a woman shall not wear a man's apparel, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for whoever does such things is abhorrent to the Lord your God. Uh, of the verses that are used against trans folks, I think this is probably the one that is most often cited, at least in my experience. Um, and it's interesting to think about the historical, uh, the way that this passage and this verse has been interpreted and understood throughout history. So I wanna give us two examples of commentary about this verse, uh, about how people in the ancient world understood it. The first one is from Thomas Aquinas. Um, if you are a Catholic, you know about Thomas. Um, <laughs> uh, Thomas Aquinas said, the outward apparel should be consistent with the estate of the person according to the general custom. Hence, it is in itself sinful for a woman to wear man's clothes or vice versa, especially since this may be a cause of sensuous pleasure, something we hate in Christianity. Uh, <laughs> it's expressly forbidden in the law because Gentiles used to practice this change of attire for the purpose of idolatrous superstition. Nevertheless, this may be done sometimes without sin on account of some necessity, either in order to hide oneself from enemies or through lack of other clothes or from some similar motive. <laughs> so even Thomas Aquinas recognized that there were loopholes in this situation. Uh, First of all, he recognizes, according to the general custom, right? He recognizes that things are different in different places. Um, and he, he points that there are, um, uh, he points to the fact that um, there are times when 
the preservation of life is more important than following this rule about clothes. <laughs> uh, in order for, in, in some, for some necessity to hide yourself from enemies through lack of other clothes or a similar motive, right? He recognizes that there's a loophole here. Um, uh, interestingly enough, this passage was actually part of the defense for Joan of Arc. Um, when Joan of Arc uh, was um, killed, she uh, was first, basically she was killed because she chose to chose to continue wearing men's clothes, um, even though, um, as far as we know, no other clothes were ever provided for her while she was being held captive. <laughs> so this, or this passage from Thomas Aquinas was part of her defense, and unfortunately, it wasn't enough to save Joan. Um, but I think it's interesting to note what's going on here. Also to note that Thomas seems to think that the reason this verse was written was because uh, he says, Gentiles used to practice this change of attire for the purpose of idolatrous superstition. Basically, what he's saying is um, the people of Israel, uh, where they're living when Deuteronomy is written, um, there were other cultures around them that we think used to uh, dress in more gender expansive ways as part of the worship of other gods. So it's a bit of a slippery slope argument that's being made here. It's like, don't start wearing what those people wear because then you'll start worshiping their gods. Um, and so if that's what's going on, like that's, that's one reason why we think this verse might have been written. Um, so keep that in mind, hold on to that. The other bit of commentary that I wanna bring up here um, is from Abraham Ibn Ezra, who's another Jewish um, uh, commentary writer uh, writing about 1000-ish uh, um, CE. And he says, the passage dealing with the attire of a man is juxtaposed to the passages dealing with going out to war because woman was created to rear children. And if she were instead to go out among the men to war, she would eventually become involved in debauchery. So again, real, really uh, unhappy about the idea of people having any sort of uh, sexual pleasure <laughs> in these older writings. Um, uh, and some specific ideas about gender and what different people of different genders are supposed to do, right? Um, the reason I bring this passage up or this bit of commentary up is because Ibn Ezra thinks that the reason this passage was written was not necessarily because of the worship of other gods. He thinks it's about um, not just general everyday clothing, it's about specifically um, things like armor and weapons and, and things related to war, things related to battle. So for Ibn Ezra, he, he doesn't see this as like your everyday clothing. This is about special clothing. So these are two possibilities, two understandings of this particular passage. So I want us to hold those two understandings as we look at two examples from the Bible. Um, first, uh, we're gonna look at the example of um, Deborah, who we read about in the book of Judges. Um, whoop, there we go. In the book of Judges, we hear the story of Deborah and um, she is the only female leader of Israel in, in the book of Judges, and I believe ever. Um, and she is a essentially not just a prophet, but also a military leader. Um, she picks this guy, Barak, who becomes her general, and she is going to lead the Israelites out from under an oppressive regi regime. God tells her, like, I, we're going to go to this battle. And so Deborah calls to Barak and says, all right, Barak, get our armies together. We're going to uh, break our way out of this, essentially. And Barak says, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 warriors went up behind him, and Deborah went up with him. So in this passage, which I include, it has a lot of names and places, right? But I include this full bit of the passage because we are told so many times that Deborah is going to battle, essentially. Uh, she's going, the glory is going to lead, uh, going to um, come to a woman. It turns out not being Deborah, it turns out being an, a, another woman later in the story, but um, she's gonna be there. She went with them and then Deborah went up with them. Like the fact that Deborah is there is repeated multiple times. So this idea of Deborah as a military leader kind of flies in the face of not only expected gender roles of the time, but also that possible understanding of women not, not being um, allowed to have 
uh, anything to do with war and dressing up for war. Now, of course, we're not told what Deborah's wearing, right? Um, so that's kind of, that's not clear to us. But the fact that she is there and she's involved in this gender role that was not one that was sort of normalized um, for women at the time is an interesting comparison when we think about why that verse about clothing was written. So thinking about another verse that is specifically where we are told what somebody is wearing, um, thinking about the story of Joseph. Um, we, uh, you remember Joseph because he had a Technicolor dream coat. Um, Joseph, we are told in Genesis 37, um, was loved by his father more than any other of his father's children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So with Joseph, um, we get this person who is, is given this garment, and um, I've got it highlighted there, a long robe with sleeves is what it's called in the New Revised Standard Version, but you can find um, a coat with fringes, a coat with tassels, a coat of many colors, a colorful coat, so many versions of what Joseph is wearing. Um, and the reason we have so many versions, so many translations from the Hebrew of what Joseph is wearing is because we don't know what it was. <laughs> the thing he, uh, Joseph is wearing in Hebrew is called a ketonet pasim. Um, and basically that's two words, ketonet pasim is two words. And one word we know means garment of some kind, but the other word, we're not really sure how it makes sense in the context uh, of what's going on with Joseph. So, you know, trans translators, they go through the whole Bible and they're like, where can we find this thing to get some more context? This thing, this Ketonet Pasim only shows up in one other place um, and it's in 2 Samuel. It's in the story of Princess Tamar. Uh, and we're told Princess Tamar was wearing a long robe with sleeves, a Ketonet Pasim, for this is how the virgin daughters of the king were clothed in earlier times. So we're told sort of exactly what this thing is in 2 Samuel. And so when translators and, and theologians and commentary writers, they go back and they look at this and they go, hang on, why is Joseph wearing a princess dress? <laughs> kind of putting two, two, two and two together here. Why is Joseph wearing a princess dress? Um, when we look at the whole story of Joseph, so much of Joseph's story um, gets outside the bounds of gender. He is constantly referred to in language that is more feminine. Um, he is constantly uh, sort of written about in this more feminine sense, and he takes on a lot of sort of feminine roles in a lot of places in his story. Um, and so Joseph, um, especially in Jewish communities, has been read as sort of canonically genderqueer and, and queer in general for a long time. Um, so Joseph might be an example of somebody who uh, seems to sort of go against the rules about what's okay and what's not okay to wear. And yet he is one of the only people in the Bible who is a good person throughout pretty much his entire story. <laughs> So many of the characters in the Bible screw up repeatedly. And that's like a good lesson for us to note that like they screw up, they learn better, they find ways to repair things, they're still loved, right? Those are all important. But Joseph is generally a good guy who is beloved by God his whole life. And yet he seems to be outside of the bounds of gender in many ways. So it's an interesting sort of, again, complement to that verse about clothing. Um, okay, cool. Just double checking here. Um, so I want to talk for a minute about, for a couple minutes, about rules for physical changes. Now we talked a little bit about um, clothing. We talked a little bit about um, ways that you express your gender. Um, thinking about our bodies and the body section of this whole thing. Um, Deuteronomy 23.1 is another verse that is sometimes used against trans folks. This verse says, no one whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. And I always joke that I was in Awana for many years and I did Bible drills all the time and they never made me memorize this verse. <laughs> and I just can't imagine why. Um, this verse is specifically a, uh, about castration, right? About the practice of castration. And it was something that was, as far as we know, kind of common in the cultures around the community of Israel at the time. Um, so we, we get um, uh, people who have been castrated show up a lot um, in the Bible and especially in the Old Testament. Um, the word we generally use in English is eunuch, right? 
Um, and the word for eunuch um, shows up uh, over 42 times in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Um, the complicating factor about this word in, in the Hebrew is that sometimes it's used to mean a person who's been castrated, and sometimes it's used to mean uh, a court official. <laughs> and it's hard, we have to take from context which one of those things is, it is. Um, and it's difficult because we think what was going on here is that um, so many court officials were eunuchs that the words just sort of became conflated, kind of like the way that we talk about Kleenex now. We don't say facial tissue, we say I need a Kleenex. Like those two words kind of just got put together. Um, so it's complicated in the Hebrew Bible when somebody is called a saris or a eunuch um, to figure out whether they are a person who is um, castrated or whether they are just a court official who's not castrated or whether they're both. In the New Testament, we get the word eunuchos in Greek, and that's where we get our English word. And that's only used eight times. So it only shows up a, a couple times in the New Testament. So I want to look at places where this shows up. As far as we know, uh, eunuchs were treated as sort of a third gender in the social orders of Babylon, Persia, and Egypt. We have a little bit of information about them in those three places. So usually a eunuch was somebody who was assigned male at birth and then was castrated but not always. Um, sometimes the word eunuch was used for people who were infertile, who couldn't have children. Um, and sometimes it was used, we believe now, for those that we now know as intersex, people with differences in sex development. So a little bit about eunuchs, and we're going to talk about where they show up. So uh, we've got that verse, right? No eunuchs allowed in the assembly of the Lord, right? That happens in Deuteronomy. Post Deuteronomy, after Deuteronomy was written, the people of Israel are taken captive into Babylon and then into Persia. And so this map, I know it's probably pretty small on your screen, uh, but this map is a map of the sort of journey that the Israelites went on from their homeland into slavery in Babylon. You can see that red line there is, is their journey. At the same time that the Israelites were captured and brought into Babylon, there is movement back along that same red line the other way, the other direction. Because the Babylonians and the Persians did this very smart, very sinister thing where they said, well, all this land that the Jewish people used to live in is now essentially mostly empty. So let's take our own people and we'll go settle their land while they're sort of gone, while they're over here with us. So there was a, a swap of people along that red line. So that's important to know during the exile period. It's important to know that in Babylon and Persia, castration was super common. Um, so you get these Jewish people who are in the situation where they're in a new culture. Um, some of them uh, were castrated against their will um, as part of this enslavement. Um, we also have some uh, uh, texts that show that some people may have chosen to be castrated um, uh, for a multitude of reasons, it seems like. Um, some of them have to do with being able to, like if you are going to be an enslaved person who's making bricks all day um, in uh, doing incredibly hard labor that is sometimes deadly, or you can be you know, a palace advisor um, as somebody who is a eunuch. Uh, sometimes that trade-off was something that people were willing to make. It's a, we don't have a lot to go on right now in, in terms of our um, understanding of why people would have made those choices. Um, but we do know that there was a variety of reasons. So we've got people moving back and forth against around this red line, right? So at the end of the Babylonian captivity, uh, we get, uh, we, we read some in the book of Isaiah about the people coming back from the Babylonian captivity. Um, and we get this sort of new word from God in this moment where people are coming back they're rebuilding their homeland and they're wondering, how do we rebuild after this? How do, we, uh, how do we rebuild the temple which has been destroyed? How do we rebuild our society? What do we do? And they look back to Deuteronomy and they see this verse about uh, eunuchs, about eunuchs not being allowed in the assembly of the Lord. And I think personally that this is very, um, it's analogous to the experience of many um, Christians today who have LGBT family members where they go, okay, I know that the church or the institution is telling me that these family members shouldn't be allowed in, but they're my family members, right? You can imagine that something similar was happening here. There were so many people at this point that everybody would have known somebody who was a eunuch, 
that to go back to rebuild a homeland and go, oh, but my sibling, my parent, my child isn't supposed to be allowed in, what do I do with that, right? It would have been a very complex situation. So in the book of Isaiah, we get this beautiful new um, prophetic word Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Happy is the mortal who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and refrains from doing any evil. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. First of all, if you're wondering if that last sentence is a double entendre about the eunuchs, it is. Uh, <laughs> biblical writers love double entendres. <laughs> and it, the more you read in the original languages, the more you notice them. <laughs> but this beautiful passage talks about these two groups of people, eunuchs and foreigners, who are so worried about being kicked out, who are so worried about not being allowed in the community, that, that maybe God doesn't love them, that they're worthless, right? This sense of, I am just a dry tree, I can't produce anything. That concern is being lifted up to God, and God says, you know what? No, you get a special thing. You get a place in my house, right? Um, you get a place in the community. So these people, um, the eunuchs, and then when it says foreigners, it means these people who had sort of been, who had moved back along that red line and been settled in, um, uh, in that area. There was a concern about like, what do we do? Do we kick everybody out who's not supposed to be in, you know, uh, according to Deuteronomy? And this, this passage seems to gain say that, to say, no, there's going to be something new happening here. A new kind of community is going to happen. Um, now, the problem is, as beautiful as this was, not everybody was super on board with the idea of inclusion, <laughs> uh, as, as we see today as well. Um, not everybody was on board with that idea. And so what ended up happening was sort of a mix of people getting kicked out and some rules being relaxed. Um, and you can read more about the kicking out process in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, there's a whole thing about um, people being sent away from the community, right? So it was a really traumatic time. I, we would imagine. Um, so that's kind of setting things up for when Jesus shows up, right? A couple hundred years later, Jesus shows up. And Jesus talks about eunuchs one time, um, specifically. Jesus says, not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. So there's three categories Jesus talks about here, right? Eunuchs who have been so from birth, eunuchs who are made eunuchs by others, and eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs, right? So the first category, eunuchs who have been so from birth, um, if Jesus is talking literally here, it makes sense that he would be talking about intersex people, people with differences in sex development. Um, around the time that Jesus existed, they were compiling the Talmud, which is another collection of Jewish uh, wisdom and law, and in the Talmud, they recognize four different ways, really five different ways, of being uh, intersex. They recognize the androgynos, the tum tum, the ilonite, and the saris. The saris, of course, is the one that we've been talking most about. Um, these four ways of being intersex, these four different kind of intersex variations, were familiar to people in Jesus's day. Um, and there's this sort of uh, uh, um, difference here, uh, they break saris into two categories, somebody who's born with differences in their uh, external genitalia and the person who is um, castrated by others, right? So that's kind of broken up into two groups there. But they knew about intersex people in Jesus's time. And so it would not be uh, unusual for Jesus when he says they're eunuchs who've been so from birth to be referencing these people who have differences from the moment they're born, right? Um, then he says there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, those who are castrated by others, right? That's a pretty obvious one. So the one that we all argue about is who that third category is, eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Um, I would highly recommend um, Megan DeFranza's book, uh, Intersex, um, and I think I quote it here in a second, um, uh, Intersex People in the 
Image of God, I think is what it's called. I'll show you in a minute. It's in like two slides. But I would highly recommend her book specifically on this passage and intersex folks, because she talks about how um, this passage was seen as much more literal originally, and then became a, um, um, a metaphor that was used for celibacy later on, especially in the Catholic church and in the priesthood. So when we're looking at this, um, when we're looking at Jesus talking about these people, um, he may be speaking literally, he may be speaking metaphorically. It's been seen both ways in Christian history. But regardless, what we do know is that Jesus points to eunuchs, people who lived outside of the gender binary of their day, and says they understand something. They understand something about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus sees them positively, and that's important. I'm going to skip this slide here. Um, uh, uh, David J. Hester, when he's talking about this, he talks about how Jesus heals all of these different people but in the case of the eunuch, there is no implication of illness or social deformity in need of restoration. Instead, the eunuch is held up as the model to follow. This person who is outside of the gender binary is not sick, is not in need of fixing. They just are, and they get something about this that Jesus notices. So here's the book I meant to, I was trying to remember the, um, the title of, Sex Differences in Christian Theology, Male, Female, and Intersex in the Image of God. In this particular book, um, uh, Megan DeFranza says that Jesus takes up the shameful identity of the eunuch and turns it upside down into an identity for his disciples, um, a personal identity that did not conform to the gender ideals of the ancient world. So I would highly recommend that book. It is dense, <laughs> but it's got a lot of really good information. So the last time that we talk about eunuchs here um, is in uh, uh, um, Acts chapter eight, and we hear the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And this person, so much has been written about this person because they are fascinating. Like I find this story to be one of the most complex and fascinating stories in the entire Bible. Um, this person, the Ethiopian eunuch, has so many complex and intersecting um, uh, identities um, as a person who is um, Ethiopian, as a person who is black, as a person who is um, uh, outside the gender binary as a eunuch, as a person who is reading Jewish texts and going to the temple to pray, but doesn't appear to be Jewish. Um, this person is in in-between places in so much of their life in terms of their identity. And when the Ethiopian eunuch meets Philip, um, uh, Philip is sent to speak to this Ethiopian eunuch and they read scripture together. And the Ethiopian eunuch asks this question at the end of this passage. They say, what is to prevent me from being baptized? What is to prevent me from being part of this community? What is to prevent God's love from reaching me? The, all these questions are wrapped up. And we know the end of this story. Uh, and so this ending, like the question becomes rhetorical for us. We think, well, nothing, obviously, because we know the end of the story already. <laughs> but that question, what is to prevent me is so foundational to the lives and experiences of so many LGBTQ plus people. Um, and uh, it's something that the, the Ethiopian eunuch asks and Philip, rather than answering, rather than um, giving a whole speech about like, you've got to pray the sinner's prayer or you've got to stop being this and that, you've got to change your identity, none of that. Philip just baptizes them, period, and they're in. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful story then. And it's, it's one of the first two converts, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and Cornelius, which happened right next to each other, are the first two converts to Christianity. So this person, a person of color, a person uh, of African uh, experience and heritage, a person who is outside the gender binary is at the foundation of the Christian church. Um, and that is something I think we so often forget. So I love this story. So does gender matter? <laughs> does gender matter at all at the end of the day? Um, Galatians 3.28 is one that a lot of us are familiar with. There is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Does this verse mean that our identities don't matter anymore? Um, this can so often, it has in Christian history and can create um, a whitewashing aesthetic of saying, well, we're all just the same in Christ. Your identity is in Christ, therefore you shouldn't worry about anything else. <laughs> um, you are a Christian first and foremost, everything else is whatever, you know? 
Um, is that really what's, what Paul is saying in his letter to the Galatians? I was really moved and I thought this was really well said. Um, this is from a paper by Brigitte Call called Gender Trouble in Galatia. Um, and Brigitte, this is kind of um, academic language here, but she basically says, how does Paul define unity, right? You can have unity in two different ways. Either A plus B becoming C, that is finding a new way of coexistence, mutuality and community that changes and preserves old identity and distinctions, right? So A plus B equals a whole new thing that incorporates everything. Or you can have A plus B united into A. That is one just swallows up the other, making differences disappear. And Brigitte says, Paul's basic concern uh, is the messianic transformation of Jewish identity towards an inclusiveness that can integrate difference without ceasing to be Jewish. His insistence that the Galatian non-Jews remain as they are, that is uncircumcised, shows that the oneness of God and Israel is no longer marked by sameness and superiority. So all this to say that when Paul says these, these categories, you know, we are one in Christ, these categories are uh, no longer, right, than, and we are in one in Christ, we could read this as saying everybody just integrate and become the same. Um, and sort of that sort of melting pot where you're all, all your individual identities cease to be. <laughs> or we can read this as Paul saying, there's going to be an entirely new thing here, uh, a new thing in, in Jesus that unites those first two categories of people, right? And makes something completely different. So I, I would argue that Paul isn't saying here that gender doesn't matter uh, or doesn't exist. But Paul does seem to be saying that our old categories of understanding, like Brigitte says here, that have to do with hierarchy um, and with, uh, uh, with sort of um, the power dynamic part of this, Paul's saying that should not be a part of our Christian communities. So let's finish up before we look at some questions. I wanna just show you a couple of ways, a couple of passages where trans folks have written about seeing themselves in scripture. Um, uh, and this is, you know, these are categories of scripture where it's like the people in them are not necessarily gender diverse, but gender diverse people today look at them and go, oh, I see something that's like me here. So the first one is the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Of Jacob stealing Esau's blessing. Um, and Jacob goes in and he's all dressed up in skins, right? And he's pretending to be his brother. And that's the story, right? Um, Joy Layden, who I love, she's a wonderful um, Jewish trans woman who's an author. And, and she talks about how um, so often trans people are seen as tricksters, as people trying to play off being somebody that they're not. Um, but she says, in reality, we present ourselves as the opposite of the gender we were assigned at birth to reveal, not to conceal who we are. Jacob really is trying to commit fraud and trying to pass as someone he knows he isn't to steal a blessing that isn't intended for him. Even though I knew that Jacob was not a transsexual, uh, Joy, I should say, uses the word transsexual for herself, even though it's not a widely used word um, by most people. Even though I knew uh, that Jacob was not a transsexual when I read this story as a child, I saw it as a story about one of the most painful aspects of my own experience. Jacob and I were both pretending to be sons we knew we weren't, hoping our parents wouldn't recognize the truth hidden beneath our clothes and skins. So this sense of having to um, hide yourself was something that Joy saw in this story, even though she knew that so much of it was not the same, which I find really interesting. Another example here is from Job. Um, Job, of course, is the story of this person who uh, was afflicted by all these terrible things. And so many of Job's friends, including this person Zophar, um, basically said, Job, it's your fault. <laughs> if you would just be a better person, all these terrible things wouldn't have happened to you, is essentially their argument. Uh, and Job says in this passage, um, there is no violence on my hands. My prayer is pure. This is, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And the story of Job is one that Chris Dowd and Christina Beardsley, um, they really, they see Job as a great story that connects to trans experience. They say, um, uh, the connection between these two works at a deep level, it arises from the narrative of a person persecuted, blamed, and excluded in order to allow people to remain in their theological comfort zones. Um, 
Uh, the analogy goes deeper as the story unfolds to reveal a figure who experiences extreme loss, social isolation, slander, and despair, and yet retains a faith in themselves and in God. So this story here is, uh, the connection here is that so often trans people, especially like people look at the rate of suicide, like the suicide rate for the trans community, and they go, well, if there wasn't something wrong with you, you wouldn't have such a large suicide rate, right? completely ignoring the fact that it is the minority stress of being treated as, a, being marginalized as a community that causes mental health crises. <laughs> so like, there's a, a sense of people telling you like, it's your fault you're like this. If you would just be better, this wouldn't have happened, right? And the story of Job um, gives us this uh, example of saying like, no, actually that's not what this is about. And not only is that not what this is about, but I am going to continue my relationship with a loving God um, regardless. <laughs> so I, I would uh, definitely suggest reading more in trans faith about that story. Um, I'm going to skip us to this last one here. This is a story of um, Doubting Thomas. Uh, we are all familiar, I think, with Doubting Thomas. Uh, Jesus appears to the disciples after his resurrection. Thomas is not there the first time, and Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I touch his hands and his side, right? So finally this happens. Jesus shows up, uh, Jesus says to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This uh, uh, story about somebody needing to see differences in somebody's body in order to believe that they are who they say they are <laughs> resonates with a lot of trans people. And so this uh, these uh, paintings here have often been depicted near each other. Um, the first one is, of course, uh, by Caravaggio, a classic painting of Thomas touching the wound in Jesus's side. And the, the, the uh, picture here by Elizabeth Olsen Wallen is of a trans man, or maybe a trans masculine person post top surgery um, with that people pointing at his top surgery scars. Um, and this idea of the people, um, people needing to see sort of proof of a difference in your body um, is something that a lot of trans people get. <laughs> and what I think is so interesting about the story of Jesus and Thomas is that I think Jesus makes a distinction between saying, I will show you, Thomas, like I will show you what's going on with my body. But when he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, it's almost this moment of saying like, but I'm not gonna do this for every Joe on the street. <laughs> like if, because I have a relationship with you, Thomas, I will be vulnerable in this way, but this is not something that everybody's gonna get. And you don't get to just demand that people put their bodies or their um, maybe even their trauma on display so that you can believe them to educate them. That's not how this is gonna work. <laughs> Um, and so I love that sort of difference that Jesus is, that, that boundary that Jesus is walking with Thomas. So those are a couple of stories that resonate with trans people today. So now I know we have very few minutes for questions, but I want to look at some and see what's up here. Um, I do want to put, before we uh, go too far, um, links to uh, more resources. So if you are like, wow, that was a lot of information really fast, or uh, I only got a snippet of that and I want to know more. <laughs> um, if you go to Transmission Ministry Collective, uh, the, our website, transmissionministry.com, um, we have resource pages there for trans folks, for gender expansive folks, for par <coughs> parents and family members, and for clergy and ministry leaders that have full lists of more resources. So if you want to read more, watch more, listen more, whatever. Um, go and check out those resource lists because there's a lot more to learn about this stuff. So let me look at the Q&A really quickly. Um, what are your reactions to using he, him pronouns for God? My personal thing is that um, I personally just don't use any pronouns for God. I just use God, which then ends up with things like God, God, self, which always feels weird to say. <laughs> um, I think in churches, one of the best things we can do is use a variety of pronouns for God. Um, use he, use she, use they. Don't, like my personal thing is, I don't like to rewrite scripture in terms of like, I'm not gonna say a metaphor or a way of talking about God gender in a gendered way 
is wrong, but I want to integrate more possibilities. Um, so that's kind of been my way of dealing with it, um, if that helps at all. How might we navigate the historical context in which scriptures are written with our current context without interpreting things onto the text which may not be there? Um, thinking about how the majority of scripture being written for mainly a male audience, how may we find ourselves there as LGBTQ people? Yeah, that's part of like when we were talking it earlier about like moving from the two box to the spectrum to the 3D model, like that's kind of what, what we're looking at here is like we have so much we can learn from these from these writings and they affect our lives in such a huge way. And yet we believe that God is still speaking in the world. We believe that the Holy Spirit is still working in the world um, and still giving um, revelation, right? And still giving understanding. And so I think in terms of how we can work with these texts when they maybe weren't written for people like us, um, I think we use them as our basis and our foundation, but there's more beyond that, if that makes sense. That's just my feeling about it. Um, do, 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 do. Um, uh, I'm not gonna get to all these, but I'm just trying to pick a couple here. Um, are there good scholarly resources about Hebrew attitudes towards eunuchs prior to Isaiah? Also about Hebrew experiences as eunuchs in Babylon. Daniel as a possible eunuch? Yes. So um, many people in the Bible are uh, have the word Sarius used for them. And then when we translate it into English, we just like don't really talk about that. <laughs> so Daniel is talked about as a Sarius occasionally. Um, so is Nehemiah, which is weird because the book of Nehemiah is one of those more exclusionary books. Um, so there are people in the Bible um, uh, and there are like, you can, if you Google, you know, like, Nehemiah, eunuch, sorry, so you're going to find um, stuff about that. Uh, it is really interesting. In terms of um, uh, Hebrew attitudes about eunuchs prior to Isaiah, we don't have a ton. It's like there's so, um, so much of our writing is um, uh, within and post exile. There's not a lot pre exile that we have to go on. Um, there are some. I would recommend. Uh, checking in with your local seminarians <laughs> because they might be able to give you access to their uh, library, for instance, because it's harder to find in just general on the general internet. All right, so that's it. We are at our time. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, I think that's where we have to stop for today. Um, but I really, really appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to continue putting questions in the Whova platform, I will try to get to as many of them as I can. Uh, and thank you so much for being here.